Welcome to MSUA's The Pulse, where we speak with leaders from across the mobile technology and satellite industries about the future of connectivity, communications, and enterprise technology. I'm your host for today's session, Roger McGarrahan. I'm the CEO of Pathfinder Digital. Pathfinder is proud to be sponsoring today's episode of MSUA's The Pulse. We have an excellent panel today. They've joined us to talk about the emerging field of optical wireless communications, especially as it applies to satellite communications. In today's session, we will talk about what it is, why it's important, and the role the mobile satellite industry will play in the exciting enterprise solution that solves a host of challenges and uncovers new opportunities. With us for today's panel is Michael Abad Santos and Robert Brumley. Mike has over 20 years of experience in the telecommunications industry and satellite industry, primarily focusing on supporting US and non-US government entities globally. Currently, Mr. Abad Santos is the Senior VP of Strategy and Business Development for BridgeCom, a small business focused on space, airborne, and terrestrial applications of optical wireless communications. Prior to joining BridgeCom team, Mr. Abad Santos was the Senior VP of Americas for LeoSat, a startup focused on low earth orbit communications, specifically designed for enterprise and government users. Prior to joining LeoSat, Mike was the Chief Commercial Officer of Trustcom, where he was responsible for sales and marketing operations globally. And from 2004 to 2014, Michael helped several leader, held several leadership roles at MRSAT, focused on the US government business and creating the Global Government Business Unit. Also with us is Bob Romley. Bob is the Chairman and CEO of Laserlight Companies. Bob brings extensive executive experience in the management and financing of early stage ventures, particularly in aerospace, telecommunications, and defense. In 2012, he was appointed to Senior Managing Director of Laserlight Communications and Laserlight Global UK. Bob became the CEO of both firms in 2013. Laserlight intends to deploy uh, uh, the world's first optical global communication system, the Halo Global Network, which is designed as a 33 terabits per second capacity, eight to 12 Neo optical satellite system. Laser Light's intended purpose is to serve as the 21st global, uh, 21st century global data distribution platform for commercial, civil science, and defense customers throughout the mediums of space, terrestrial, and subsea. Bob was a Senate confirmed presidential appointee in the Reagan administration, serving in both terms. And Bob is also retired Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Uh, let's start with uh, framing up what we mean by optical wireless communications. Um, Bob, we hear the terms free space optics and laser com and OWC. Uh, can you help us understand what optical wireless communications is? Broad question. Uh, the free space optic term is a technical term. Uh, the optical wireless communication terminology is one that's really related to, uh, I think, more applications. It's, uh, it's a lot easier to basically understand. There is optical fixed uh, communications, which is fiber, and then wire obviously wireless communications would be in the air, or in this case, in the air and space. So it's become sort of a shorthand term. Um, where it came from is it's been around for about 35 years. Uh, some would say it's a technology looking for a viable business application. Uh, it has been used mostly in niche uh, applications to date, uh, primarily in the area of what would be gap fillers, uh, some interesting satellite projects, all the way back to uh, Teledesic and Craig McCaw and Paul Allen and uh, Bill Gates back in the, uh, the mid to late 90s, uh, going from what they wanted to use it for was inter-satellite links. Uh, Lots of capacity, lots of efficiency. Uh, the best example I can give you is take out 100 straws out of a straw box and stick it into one pipe. And you've got basically the capacity of an optical wireless connection. Each one of those little straws is an RF connection. So if you throw all the little straws out, you've got that big pipe and you've got all that, uh, all that data being able to flow through for roughly the same capex. And until, and, and basically, without all the hassle about going through spectrum. And I know the members of this association understand the value of spectrum. Uh, in this case, this is unlicensed real estate uh, that happens to be about a hundred times broader in capacity than uh, the real estate that they're using for current applications. So it's pretty exciting stuff, but the challenge is, is to find where the CapEx advantage and the OpEx advantage fit into the operational constraints. And so it's that kind of balance that companies like mine and companies 
like Mike's happens to be working on now and other companies that are working on, uh, which a lot of money is flowing into, the, uh, uh, into its development, both government as well as private sector. And you know, we all use this, this somewhat now outworn phrase, the era of, uh, uh, the era of light is upon us, but it, it really is true. Optical or laser comms, as I like to call it, this is its time and um, it's gonna be pretty exciting. Thank you. Um, Mike, Bob alluded to the fact that there are certain advantages that optical communications have over traditional RF, especially in terms of data speeds. Uh, can you just comment a little bit about what we might expect and, and why we're interested in OWC and its applications with uh, satellite to ground, ground to satellite? Sure. Um, well, there's, there's several aspects to that. Um, the first one is the amount of data content that's being generated uh, by all of these different space platforms and sensing platforms and the amount, the demand for that uh, content and the, the generation of the content is just exploding beyond anything that we've planned for, right? So, uh, you know, we're seeing that on the terrestrial side in terms of how much bandwidth we need for applications to get to the home and, and to just in our daily lives, but just from an enterprise perspective, corporations and governments are demanding more and more data. And as Bob alluded to, the current RF spectrum that is there is not going to be able to meet the needs for future data requirements um, as we go forward. Um, and it's really, you know, one of the aspects, Bob mentioned that, you know, there is a lot of investment in free space optics or optical wireless communications right now. But uh, prior to getting on this call, I just got off of another call with the government in which in the last two years, they've spent over $500 uh, billion, dollars, or $500 million, excuse me, on just figuring out ways to dynamically um, address spectrum allocations on the current RF spectrum, as opposed to looking for new mechanisms to transmit data. So we have the one aspect of there's very scarce or there's gonna be limited RF capacity the amount of data being generated and consumed is outpacing where the market's going and, and, and what it's able to handle. Um, and on top of that, we have additional needs for security. So free space optical or optical wireless communications offers higher levels of security, um, not only because the beams are much smaller um, and they're directed towards their intended customer, um, but they're higher, they're harder to detect. So low probability of intercepts, low probability of detection. Um, in terms of certain applications, uh, especially in space, free space optical communications um, does provide latency uh, benefits. So customers, enterprise customers looking for latency specific uh, requirements, um, you know, with inter-satellite links and the type of network that Bob's building, they will see better performance across their networks. And as the networks perform in space perform more like the networks on the terrestrial side, we'll see less, uh, or we'll see more transparency between applications and we'll just be able to focus on the, on the app side as opposed to physical layers. Excellent, thank you. Um, Bob, we're gonna talk in a few minutes about where we think uh, we're gonna see applications of OWC in the satellite industry, uh, but could you um, have a few comments for us in terms of where we are today where we see optical wireless communications, free space optics being utilized at this point in time? Uh, being utilized, you mean currently? Yeah, currently, kind of the state of the industry and its application. Yeah, I mean, the, um, uh, like I said earlier, the, 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 the use of FSO, our OWC, uh, has been around for about 30 some years. Uh, there have been government programs where it's been through demo to actual use some classified programs that are carrying uh, mostly in the area of what I, I can say would be inter-satellite link capabilities. Uh, there are public civil science programs, the LADI program, which actually did a 660 megabit stream from the lunar, uh, from a lunar orbit. Actually, they broadcast Bill Guy, the science guy program from uh, orbiting the moon to the, uh, to the earth on free space optics. Uh, then they did something silly, which was crash the spacecraft into the moon and that was the end of that. So uh, you also have EDRS, the European Data Relay System, which is active. They have two out of three satellites in GEO. Then when they get the third one up around 2024, they'll actually have a global 
uh, uh, all optical uh, satellite link capability. You, uh, the, the additional work has been on the, on the non-necessarily success side has really been on the terrestrial point-to-point -point side. Uh, there has been quite a bit of investment in that, but it is now starting to, I think, start to pay some dividends. For example, things that a Bridgecom is doing, uh, both in multiplex systems on terrestrial uh, uh, use of free space optics or OWC, as well as some work that the, hyperscale, uh, the uh, high frequency traders are using to gap fill running side by side microwaves such as 5G uh, on short hops point to point to skip fiber choke points. So what you're seeing here is on the actual use of this, it is being applied to areas where uh, its capabilities are enhanced and its, and its uh, deficiencies, if you will, its, its uh, vulnerability to atmospherics primarily <coughs> are mitigated and, and are reduced. And then capital is flowing that way. It's fine and all right, I like that plan because you're getting an enhancement over here without the drag of what would be the performance restrictions. And, uh, and those decisions now are real decisions that are being made in the marketplace. Uh, Mike, anything you wanna add on the use in uh, kind of rural and remote areas of OWC for broadband applications? Well, absolutely. I mean, so we're absolutely seeing um, uh, a lot of new applications being based off of optical wireless communications. Um, one, you know, Bob started talking about some of the problems in terms of atmospheric conditions, et cetera, and we are getting better at applying, you know, forward error correction. Um, you know, we, we, we're using 1550 nanometers because of its um, resilience towards certain weather um, interference in space. We don't have that issue, but from a terrestrial perspective, we do. Um, maybe, so Mike, it, maybe, you know, maybe, real, maybe real quick, could you just kind of frame up, uh, kind of uh, being that that's one of the major challenges of implementing OWC solutions, could you maybe just frame that up for people who may not be familiar with those challenges of uh, optics? Well, sure. Yeah. So um, uh, free space optics is a point or a line of sight uh, communications mechanism. And um, there are uh, you know, because of the wavelength that the beams travel at, they're highly susceptible to atmospheric conditions. So um, rain being one condition, um, although we are developing forward error correction techniques in order to address rain. And rain's really interesting, right? So uh, a laser beam can kind of walk between raindrops or bounce between rain raindrops and you can still get to, uh, you can still deliver power to your distant, you know, your receiver um, and close a signal with um, uh, various, you know, drops in uh, power, but you can still get uh, the signal across. Uh, where the biggest challenge that we see are clouds, um, smog, smoke, um, in which we get full attenuation. But, you know, we, there are different ways to address that. Um, and one of the ways that Bridgecom has really been focused on for the past 18 months is how do we get terrestrial or how do we get free space optical or optical wireless communications networks to behave more like their traditional RF networks. Um, and the biggest weakness that we saw was that the architecture, the network architecture being limited to point to point um, systems was really the limiting factor in the widespread adoption of optical wireless communications. Um, you know, because of the one-to-one -one relationship, you don't have a lot of flexibility in how you deploy networks. Those networks that you are deploying become more expensive because they don't scale. Um, and so what we've focused on is, you know, creating a mechanism for free space optical communicate or optical wireless communications, excuse me, um, to uh, work like RF communications and point to multipoint um, and TDMA schemes and full mesh networking schemes. So that's something that we've been focusing on for the past 18 months. And our theory at the end of the day is if we can create a, a, a whole bunch of these low cost point to multipoint OWC nodes or apertures, um, and begin proliferating them through the environment, whether that's a battlefield, whether that's a space environment, uh, whether that's an urban uh, domain looking to implement 5G connectivity or a rural um, area um, where we're trying to get, um, you know, our rural communities connected. Um, 
once you can create that low cost point to multipoint or full mesh networking architecture, you can start routing traffic around fog, uh, around bad weather. And um, you know, that's, that also brings scale to the uh, enterprise as well. So driving down the, the network node costs. Um, uh, Bob, um, I know LaserLight has focused a lot on methodologies to compensate for um, uh, poor weather that might otherwise hinder an OWC uh, distribution of data from point to point. You want to talk a little bit about what LaserLight's doing? Yeah, and, and Mike actually, he, he uh, really laid it out very well. Uh, I know in 2014 at, PW, at PTC, I was asked that question in the audience. And I said, we have a very complex approach to this. We avoid the weather. And I sort of got a chuckle in the audience. But fundamentally, Mike gave a good technical explanation as to how you avoid the weather. Uh, you have a proliferation of uh, what would be in ground infrastructure, whether it be point to point terrestrial or in our case, satellite to ground, ground stations. You understand the weather dynamics in what would be the service area you're operating in. Uh, that requires real-time predictive uh, weather analytic, both capture as well as analysis that feeds into your operating system. Then your operating system that runs the entire service links uh, actually runs off the weather. So the patents that we have, uh, the things that we chose to patent for LaserLight is the operating system and its relationship to network routing, sensitivity, all driven by what would be uh, not weather, but atmospheric analytics, which includes also dust and particulate matter uh, in the troposphere, which is the nasty little place that is that last mile you have to get through going down or it'll go through on the way up with respect to this. So then to make that work, weather really changes in roughly right around 250 to 300 mile increments. Uh, hopefully you all go home tonight and watch the weather report. And when they actually put up the clouds that go across the country, I know I can't kick that habit now. I can see, <laughs> oh, it's raining in Dallas, but it's clear in Albuquerque. And that's generally the way it works is that you have incoming weather that's three to 400 miles away that influences what would be the atmospheric condition. And you get to a DB noise in the atmosphere and you decide, I don't wanna mess with it, I'll avoid it. And you drop out behind the weather and that's where you drop your data and then you bring it in on fiber. And then so in a sense, you use a fiber network like Mike is using wireless network repeaters uh, in other systems, you use a fiber network to avoid the weather and then you bring it all in onto what would be a single platform, like a hybrid platform. You wrap it in a software that is weather, you know, is sensitive to the atmospheric changes and then you take your hands off of it and you let the weather run your network. Uh, Mike, Bob talked about kind of supplementing the OWC network with fiber and wireless. Um, do you see uh, traditional RF playing a role, you know, kind of the use of hybrid networks with OWC, or is that something that you don't think is necessary for uh, an OWC application? Uh, there, uh, optical, there is no magic bu bullet, right? So um, I am a, I'm a, I'm a, major proponent of redundancy and resiliency. And one of the things I always like to say is one is none and two is one. Um, and when you're talking to government users as well, um, we, have to, we have to be cognizant of these hybrid infrastructures in order to ensure that we are getting data to where they need to go. So I absolutely do believe that hybrid architectures are the right way to go. Um, and whether it's uh, hybrid RF, um, optical wireless, or you know, if we include the terrestrial um, fiber networks as well, I think all of those all of, all of those aspects have to be put into the equation of how do we provide the best level of service, the most resilient, most redundant, that meets the specific mission requirements or customer requirements, um, and that's how we build the network architecture. So, hybrid is definitely something that. Um, especially when I talk to our government customers is something that we absolutely have to look at. And we have to build that back end um, routing plane to be able to accommodate for that. But Mike, we've talked about um, kind of how WOC is being used presently, some of its challenges, and we've just gone through some of the potential approaches to mitigate those challenges. Um, what do you see the next evolutions of OWC being? I mean, how close are we to uh, implementation of these networks and uh, what will they look like and what kind of data speeds will we achieve? 
Well, if you looked at why Bridgecom was formed in 2015, we were expecting this all to be here by now. <laughs> Always, um, right? So, <laughs> so you know, the the con the concept for Bridgecom initially was we would um, we would build these ground stations, as Bob was mentioning, to support the proliferation of all these constellations and the need to downlink data from space. Um, clearly, that hasn't happened at the rate that we we. Um, anticipated, but it, you know, we do anticipate that it will happen. Um, so, you know, we have kind of shifted um, our business focus recently on, you know, what can we do on the terrestrial and in the terrestrial and airborne markets with optical wireless communications. And that's why we've spent a lot of time in R and D dollars on point to multipoint architectures. Um, you know, so, th so we're seeing some really interesting things, right? So, uh, uh, photonic integrated circuits are, are going to be um, ways, uh, you know, I, I saw something where we're 3D printing um, photonic integrated circuits now. So that's greatly going to reduce the costs of these backplane architectures and do, you know, data center to data center, multi terabit per second kind of connect connections. Um, you know, we're seeing great improvements in, in the types of wave um, frequency modulations that are being put out there and deployed across the networks to increase, um, you know, not only security, but um, uh, latency and, and um, you know, uh, making sure that we're able to close these links. Um, you know, quantum entanglement presents a, a whole bunch, you know, I, I guess that's a new buzzword. Yeah. Um, but that, that presents a whole bunch of interesting applications and capabilities in terms of security and um, encrypting messaging. And, um, and that, that type of capability is not really um, approachable or achievable without optical wireless communications. Um, mm -hmm. You need uh, these high throughput, high performance networks in order to achieve what they're trying to do. Um, so, you know, I, from my perspective, it, it's, it's hard to put a, put a limit on where this can go. Um, every time, you know, when I was working with the government, you know, every five years, we, we tried to plan out how much bandwidth the government was going to consume um, in, a, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan or, you know, in its, in its satellite networks. And every five years, we were wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. by orders of magnitude, right? So, um, you know, you know, I, I think that's that's the way our economy is going. We have autonomous vehicles, we have um, AR, VR, all of these different applications that are good in artificial intelligence at the edge that are just going to drive the need for more and more bandwidth and data transport capability. Excellent, thank you. Um, Bob, uh, you mentioned how NASA and DARPA and other government programs were some of the leaders in practical application of OWC. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about what you see OWC uh, being applied in the commercial sector? Yeah, the, uh, uh, just to jump off what Mike uh, was outlining, let me give you an example of uh, a, a real business case that we looked at and then we basically couldn't support it. I'd much rather talk about that because there's a lot of there's a lot of movable parts in it, but it's really interesting. Uh, high frequency traders uh, are, uh, as we all know or should know, are really interested in computer trading. And if you have a millisecond or two millisecond advantage on a trade, then you sort of win that race on that trade. Uh, so high speed networks have been built from New York, for example, to Chicago, uh, spread spectrum networks. And um, they just peel off another couple of milliseconds here. They get a closer route. A lot of this is distance related, but a lot, a lot of it is also switch gear where you're going through other people's switch gear. Some of it, however, is additive to, you're not going from New York to Chicago, you're also going north south. So you're going New York, say to Hong Kong or to the exchanges in Australia. So when you get to the further reaches, Mike had mentioned earlier that free space optics or a B to C has a physics advantage over uh, light through glass. Glass is actually uh, provides a resistance, some form of resistance. And so you've got about 1.35 speed advantage over light through a vacuum space than you would through glass. So if you can get it to space and you're going a long way, 5,000 kilometers, you're sort of like secretariat. You start out last, but you end up first. 
And so it's essentially that kind of speed way that you, you, you're really taking you know, that application. So we got a request from one firm in New York saying, how, how fast can you do it, handle our trades from New York to Sydney? And so we did a latency analysis and came back and gave them a number. And we had peeled off about 20 some milliseconds, which is unheard of in this, but that's because all the switch gear and all the other switches and routings and, and everything else. It's more than a ping test. It's really just basically uh, how long it takes to actually get desktop to desktop, computer to computer, not just server to server. And they came back and went, that is phenomenal. We got to hire you guys. What's it going to cost us? And I said, okay, um, give me your economics. And uh, they said, well, there are 100 trading day there are 240 trading days a year, and there are 100 tr million trades a day. Okay, how big's a trade? It's a byte, just a byte. So there are 100 billion bytes a day times 240. And you guys can all do the math and it comes out to gigs total uh, in terms of what the volume would be. And we're a volume pricing system. And we came back and we said, you can't afford it. And he said, well, can you come up with a, can you come up with a formula? And we did, and we came back 0 0.01 cent per byte. And they went, we could just add that to the trading cost. 0.10, that's, a, that's not even a rounding error. What does that translate? $36 million a year. You know, oh, no, no, that, that's, that's a hell of a lot more than we want to pay. And then that was the end of it. But my point is, is it's not just latency, but it's also what you're transporting, the size of it, and also essentially what the market will bear. And then finally, what the customer wants, really wants, which is faster, cheaper, and better or bigger in this context. So when you apply those principles to other, uh, other products and services, uh, you get to what uh, at least we believe is different stratifications of the industry. We're focused on hyperscalers. We're focused on large OTT um, and uh, bandwidth producers in the petabyte, terabyte range. Uh, and who would rather put their traffic on our transport layer, then run it on their management layer, which would in fact be displacing customers, paying customers. So if you're upgrading your Microsoft, you're upgrading software, why not do it on our network instead of on your transport layer uh, or your management layer? Same with Google, same with Facebook, same with et cetera. So uh, that's a unique group, but they're dealing in multiple exhibits a year of data. So now you get to the tr traders, now you're dealing with exhibits, your price can come down, to hundred bucks a terabyte delivered anywhere in the world as a data packet, which is really exciting. But at the same time, you're dealing with exabytes. So your scale offsets what would be that lower cost. So it's just matching those up. Um, Mike, any, we've kind of been dancing around this, but um, any predictions for how OWC is gonna affect Southern industry? It's a, it's a broad question, but any kind of flat uh, you'd like to make on that subject? Uh, one of the jokes I like to make is I was the first casualty of the Constellation battles, right? So prior to prior to joining Bridge Commons at LeoSat and you know our business model, um, we were talking to the same customers that Bob was talking to, and um, yeah, we were clearly focused on those high-end users that valued the additional security, the lower latency, um, and uh, you know. We never, the LeoSat constellation was never designed to bring internet to the masses. That was a problem for O3B and, and, and those guys. And I think, you know, the geo, geo is still probably a more efficient way to, to solve that here, uh, problem. Um, in terms of predictions on OWC and the space um, community, I absolutely think that we will be the future architecture of space. Um, if you look at the constellations that um, the Space Development Agency are looking at, if you look at the commercial constellations, if you, if you marry that with the ever shrinking amount of RF spectrum available um, and the fact that the FCC and, and the various um, regulatory agencies throughout the world keep taking capacity away from satellite operators, uh, they're going to be looking for more innovative ways to either trunk their data and downlink it or create these um, optical intersatellite links uh, to, uh, to carry traffic across to more favorable RF downlink pricing regions. Um, 
you know, so we saw that SpaceX has uh, recently um, had uh, intersatellite links on their, their latest batch of satellites. Um, I wish them all the success in the world. And, uh, you know, I, I think that they're, they're leaning forward um, in ways that <laughs> being a traditional space guy, I could have never comprehended 10 to 20 years ago. Um, so I, I think um, they're being very innovative and they're just kind of, they've got the, the, the bit between their teeth, so to speak, and they're going forward and doing some really interesting things. But to go back to the, to the earlier question, Roger, uh, I absolutely believe that optical wireless is going to be the glue for these future constellations. Um, it's, it, it just makes sense. Um, eventually, there will not be enough RF capacity uh, that just can support the amount of traffic or, or data that these networks are, are transmitting, right? And when we designed the, the first draft of the LeoSat constellation, where we needed 10 gigabit per second, um, inter-satellite links. And by the time we got to the second draft of it, we need 100 gigabit per second inter-satellite links. And Bob's talking about terabit per second links. So I just don't see any decrease, in, you know, any slowdown in, in, the, in the rate of data generation that's going to require these new types of networking capabilities. Bob, anything you'd like to add? I'd be remiss if I didn't mention just one further step out uh, in the... Um, in free space optics, and that is, we have a sister company, Comstar Space, um, who was announced last June, and it is a hybrid uh, RF and also uh, optical communications payload, and it sits about 40,000 miles from the lunar surface and about 200,000 miles from the Earth. Uh, it'll be deployed in late 2013, excuse me, 2023, and uh, the purpose of it is, is a data relay uh, satellite similar to TDRIS, except it would be taking what would be RF from the lunar surface back to the earth through to connections to ground stations on the earth and also optical uh, that would connect to laser light and then laser light would distribute it uh, through its own network uh, globally. Uh, so it, uh, it, we, we joke a little bit about it, but actually um, Comstar really is serving the ultimate edge right now, which would be uh, the lunar surface and it's doing it in such a way that it's it's pulling from near earth which is where starlink and the other uh services service platforms are focusing on on laser comms it's pulling it out past meo which is where laser light is out to what would be cis lunar which is the next uh, uh service area that's really been underutilized or focused on to the surface of the moon and it's doing it all in an end-to-end -end platform uh in a, in a cloud context so I, I agree with Mike, uh, it kind of, I'll start the way, uh, stop the way I started. It's a really interesting technology looking for a solid application that can not only provide a return on investment, but can scale. And I think Bridgecom has got, they've, they've broken the code on what they're trying to do. I think we've broken the code on what we're trying to do. And there are others out there who are doing the same thing, but it's still a small industry still, still scaling. Great, thank you. Um, I think it's time for us to go to questions. Uh, okay, first question. Um, I guess we can go to either one of you, but Mike, maybe I'll send this one to you. Um, are there standards yet to define communications between space segment and the ground segment? Are there standards? Um, I, I think that's an ever developing thing. I know the Space Development Agency is working very hard on the development of standards. Um, right now, nothing is set in stone, which is probably good um, because that means that we can be more flexible in terms of how we want to implement specific solutions. Um, but also, you know, uh, I, I think that um, once we, once, you know, we can find a consensus among, you know, waveforms and, and frequencies, et cetera, um, that's when we'll really start uh, accelerating the rollout of these types of networks. Bob, anything to add on that topic? Yeah, as, a, as you mentioned in my resume, as a um, alumni of the Reagan administration, uh, government basically getting involved in standard setting that goes uh, into the commercial market as opposed to their own personal requirements for national security uh, is really wrong. 
I could say another word, but I, I'll use the word wrong. Um, I'll give you a really good example about, I don't know how many of you guys have traveled to and from the United States back in the robust period of GSM and PCS, but government has a tendency to want to use standards to protect their own industrial base. They want to use standards for things other than just their own requirements. Um, I've seen what the Space Development Agency is proposing, including uh, their uh, procurements relative to driving the industrial base, but along the standards that they're setting. And I will tell you that it will not work. It will become requirements if you want a government contract, but it will not be a standard that the industry and the vendors are going to embrace because it costs too much. It's really not taking into account how commercial systems work. And it has different motivations than just uh, what would be operational efficiencies. So I'm out there on a limb, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, what are the trade-offs for using optical links between satellites and users or between satellites and other satellites? Is that for me? Either one. Uh, the uh, optical links between satellites or inter-satellite links, uh, the, the trade-offs, it's all benefit from a standpoint of robustness of throughput. In other words, you're going to get more throughput between satellites by using uh, optical communications than you would with RF. Uh, the downside is an old phrase we had in telecom, fiber to the curb, copper to the house. In other words, if you only have a copper connection to your cable modem outside on the street, you're only going to get copper type service levels, like a DSL level. It's true also in space. If you're RF uplink or downlink and you're using optical between for inner satellite links, you have to do an onboard convert. And Mike is experienced with this because that's Leo's, and that was a Leo strategy, a Leo set strategy. For some platforms, that requires greater swap. Uh, space weight and power for the platform. Smaller sats that don't have swap to give to that purpose end up with essentially a burden of having to basically convert RF to optical and carry two mediums on board the spacecraft. Then they have to be able to do multiplex because you're not going to necessarily do duckling networks. You're going to have to do different kind of connections to different satellites in a dynamic environment. Some of the things uh, Bridgecom is doing on the earth may be applicable to what would be multiplex uh, in, uh, in space. So you really have some challenges there with respect to ISLs and add to it 10,000 satellites, all of the moving data dynamically off of a subscriber's appliance on RF to satellites are only overhead three to five minutes that have to convert to optical and move that data along to maybe even around the world, multi hops then reconvert it to RF and take it down to another appliance. That's a challenge. That is a real challenge. Thanks, Bob. Um, I, I was remiss in mentioning uh, for those viewers that would like to submit a question, you can use the Q&A function um, on your Zoom screen to submit those. Um, next question we have, um, are optical ground stations fixed or can they be mobile? Uh, Mike, do you wanna take a shot at that one? Yeah, so uh, traditional optical ground stations, um, the ones that Bridgecom have deployed right now are, are fixed um, and they're what you'd expect from a, a, you know, a traditional laser comm architecture, or optical wireless communications architecture. It's, you know, we have, a, uh, in one of our locations, we have a 40 centimeter telescope and in, you know, in, in, in the Middle East, we have a centimeter telescope that, you know, capable of closing 100 gigabit per second links from the Earth orbit or geo. Um, however, with what we're doing on our managed optical communications array, our point to multipoint solution, um, we are now able to shrink that architecture and um, put them into platforms that can be comms on the news platforms. So the original concept of what we were trying to build was something that we can put on an aircraft with Boeing um, and have a conformal antenna um, that is able to close, uh, you know, or, or download, you know, tens of gigabits per second to provide a really good quality in-flight connectivity solution. Um, we can take that uh, platform and transition that to ground vehicles, 
um, or just, you know, in terms of your typical optical ground station um, applications, we can have a, a much smaller form factor um, uh, telescope, for lack of a better word, that doesn't have to move, um, that can track um, within its field of view uh, electronically. So, yeah, that, that's a possibility. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that's the next question actually is a good follow on to that. Um, can optical ground stations communicate with drones, UAVs? So I guess um, not only the ground station being mobile, but the, um, the, the other platform, aerial platform being mobile. Uh, That's absolutely the case. Yeah. So, um, you know, we envision uh, not only being able to support space to airborne and space to ground comms on the moves platforms, but also air to ground platforms. So, um, you know, and this is the utility is really on the government side where we have um, areas that are operating in RF denied environments, right? So um, being able to have a secondary communications means to, uh, to be able to communicate with your, your troops and your drones or, or your UASs. Uh, via laser com or optical wireless is absolutely something that we're looking to to move into. Yeah, we, we've been uh, communicating with the folks at uh, UCF a bit, and I know they're doing uh, uh, drone to drone um, FSO, mm -hmm. and even undersea FSO. It uh, seems quite expansive. Um, yeah. Next question: um, Are there uh, many satellites in orbit communicating to the ground via FSO? So I guess you know how how many how many satellites are or buses up there actually uh, are, are beaming lasers down that we can communicate with. Uh, Bob, you want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, on commercial programs, uh, you have the, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, European data relay system that's sitting on, uh, on geos, two geos, waiting for a third. Uh, there are uh, some NASA programs like the LCRD, which is on the ISS. That's a demonstration platform, but there are a number of contractors who are looking at bringing EO data, Earth observation data, to the LCRD and then having it relayed to the ground. So it's more of a relay than a test of optics on the platform. Uh, thirdly, you've got obviously programs to which um, you can't mention which are classified programs, but there will be to look forward. SDA has a uh, a sensor layer of satellites and a tracking layer of satellites of which inter-satellite links will be part. And I think they're due up in 2022. Lockheed Martin is a provider, York is a provider. Uh, I think Mineric is providing the inter-satellite links or maybe TSAT, both, uh, both German companies. Um, so uh, to put it in the context of the, the thousand and forgetting Starlink for a minute uh, or OneWeb, the, the normal number of satellites that are in orbit, which would be geos and uh, the new uh, constellation from O3B, uh, what Viasat is doing, those have remained all um, traditional RF, enhanced RF, but traditional RF. Uh, I think the chance of seeing this market uh, really take off will be if Starlink can really demonstrate the CapEx value of, of, of inter-satellite links uh, on its platform, because then the rest of them are going to have to follow it. Uh, uh, OneWeb would have to follow to a certain degree. And Kuiper, clearly, uh, uh, a, if you follow where talent goes, Don Cornwell, who was head of the uh, uh, laser comms program at NASA, really smart guy, um, kind of miss him at NASA. He went and he works at Kuiper now. Uh, so I did, they didn't bring him over there to, to basically book library books. He's over there to do laser comms. <laughs> so I, I, I think he's going to be a real value for them. So I think Next 10 years, you're going to see a proliferation in inter-satellite links. Uh, and I can't help but say in the next uh, 36 months, you're going to see us, uh, Laserlight, put up its Neo constellation. Uh, and that'll be an all optical, both intersat as well as uh, up and down links. So it's growing. Very great. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we have time for just one more question. Uh, now many optical ground antennas are required or recommended to support a strategic ground station in the overall optical architecture. What are the price points compared to the standard parabolic and new ESA types of antennas uh, in place or being developed today? So I guess this is kind of a, uh, a swap compare question between um, optical ground stations and traditional parabolic or phased array ESAs. Uh, Mike, do you have any comments on that? 
Um, you know, having installed, you know, 16 meter standard A antennas and, and, and um, you know, now being over at Bridgecom and, and working on um, the two ground stations that we've developed. Um, yeah, we, it's much less expensive in terms of uh, deploying the optical infrastructure. Uh, doesn't require as much space per bit. Um, so, you know, for a 70 centimeter antenna, we can do that 100 gigabit per second downlink. Uh, whereas for your traditional RF parabolics, you need much larger apertures. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of how many you need to deploy uh, to, to achieve a certain type of um, service level, uh, there's a lot of variables in there, right? It depends upon, um, you know, what weather in the specific region you're trying to downlink, et cetera. Um, so, you know, and, and this is stuff that we've talked about before in terms of, you know, being able to route traffic around weather, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it, it is possible to have a, a very highly available network with optical. Um, and, you know, I, I think Bob's clearly looked at it. We've looked at it from, and we've done several analysis from a bridge comp perspective as well. And, you know, if customers are, are looking to get into that type of analysis, we're happy to talk to them. Thanks guys. So I think that's uh, all the time we have for, for questions. I'd like to take a moment to thank Pathfinder Digital, our sponsor for today's episode of MSUA's The Pulse. To learn more about Pathfinder Digital, please visit their website at pathfinderdigital.com. If you found the topic of optical wireless communications interesting and want additional information on the subject, uh, please be aware that Pathfinder Digital maintains an open wiki on the subject of optical wireless communications. Uh, where we post a wealth of information on free space optics, as well as information on the latest research and developments in the OWC field. The wiki can be found at wiki.pathfinderdigital.com, and we encourage you to use and contribute to the wiki. Uh, note that the wiki link will be included in the show notes for your reference if you didn't get that. Uh, if you want to learn more about MSUA, please visit msua.org. Here you can subscribe to Mobility News that will keep you on top of everything that's happening in the mobility satellite market on a global level. To learn how to become a member of the MSUA, please visit msua.org slash join. I want to extend a big thank you to our panelists, Bob Brumley and Mike and Bob Santos for sharing their time and insights into the world of optical wireless communications. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. I know I learned a lot and I hope uh, the viewers enjoyed it as well. Thank uh, you. Uh, thanks, thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, this episode of The Pulse.